That's right, everybody. If you're familiar with film scores, then this should be identifiable for you. Today on the show, in my first ever solo episode, we are reviewing the 1987 horror classic, Hellraiser. Now, this uh, movie was directed and co-written by Clive Barker, who had originally... This is based off a novella he wrote called The Hellbound Heart, uh, which I actually got to read um, somewhat recently for the first time. And it's it's pretty spot on with what the movie uh, tells. There's a few subtle differences. There's an extra character. I think there's one. It's, it's not a very big part. They never actually name Pinhead in the book. Um, to, to my memory, I don't believe they do. And the um, actual female Cenobite in the movie has kind of a more of a prominent role in the book. But um, I'm, I wonder why the switch for that happened. Hmm. I'm not sure. But uh, anyway, as a complete uh, coincidence, the day of this recording, I found out it is Clive Barker's birthday. So uh, a huge shout out to the uh, master of horror himself, Clive Barker, on his special day. Uh, and here I am reviewing his special movie. So this is this movie is one of my absolute favorites. Uh, this and part two are really, really good. And I think one of the biggest things about it that uh, I love so much is how original it is. How original it was at the time and still is today, some, you know, 30 years, whatever, later. Uh, this movie is still so unique and stands on its own in this world of... Like, there's movies about hell and, you know, demons and such. But this is such a weird story about, like, the correlation between what is pain and what is pleasure. And, like, this concept of somebody who has seen so many things in his life and done so many things that he's bored of existence. So he's seeking out this other unknown to try and fulfill some kind of need for... A pleasure, I guess, for uh, for Frank, the one of the main character and one of the main antagonists. Um, what's weird is that the Frank we see in the beginning, when he has all of his skin, is a different Frank than we see in the physical body when he's like just skinless. I don't know if the skinless Frank is is using a different voice. I think it's the same voice. I don't know why they would change the voice. So I think all of that's ADR. I could be wrong. Um, so yeah, this, uh, this film came out in 1987. Let's go over the deets, shall we? Uh, it came out in, in London, uh, in the release date in London was September 10th, 1987. So we just missed the anniversary. Um, the, wow, the budget was only $1 million. Now, obviously, you know, I think a lot of films back then, a lot of these bu budgets are estimated. I'm not sure what the advertising was, if there was much of anything, but our our rule here on the show has been to basically say the budget doubled. So two million, essentially, if you know, I think max two million. Um, the box office was fourteen million. So this movie, uh, I mean, obviously it's a super small scale. I, don't, I, I guess you could even call this maybe an indie movie. I I would I probably would go as far to uh, to say to say such. Um, so there was a little bit of controversy with this movie, as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, so Clive Barker was forced to make edits to the film. Um, it had originally been stuck with an X rating, um, which is un... Like, it's, God, it's so annoying. I would, I would kill to see that version. Because, honestly, the final cut of the movie doesn't differ a lot from the book. I can't remember much of anything specifically there's one bit and I, and I guess um oh god no there is one bit right in the beginning in the beginning of the book um he's like touched by one of the cenobites that he's summoned and it's it's instantly sends this like crazy shockwave through his entire body where he's kind of having this otherworldly like out of body experience um and he starts like masturbating because he has all these weird like, sensations and I guess he's not sure like he's can, is simultaneously feeling pain and pleasure, so he starts jacking off, and the book makes it a point to like mention that he like fucking jizzes all over the floor or something. So I guess I, I, that was probably in the original cut. Now that I think about it, that might be what he had to do. Uh, let's see. I actually lists here. I think um, so. These following scenes were cut to make for the R rating. Uh, two and a half shots were excised from the first Hammer murder, 
including a close-up of the hammer lodged on the victim's head. Oh, that's that's pathetic. Uh, in the scene where Julia murders another man, the actor playing the victim felt that it made sense for him to do so naked. Uh, the nude murder scene was shot, but ultimately replaced with a semi-clothed version. Close-ups of Kirstie sticking her hand into Frank's stomach, exposing his guts again. Today, that, w- that wouldn't be censored because violence and gore, for whatever reason, was... I don't know, it was looked at more, like, uh, harshly back then. I don't know why. I don't know what changed. Uh, a longer version of the scene where Frank is being torn into pieces by the Cenobites' hooks, final shot where his head explodes and his brain messily splashes out was also cut. Yeah, there was a... There was a little bit of kind of a quick cut. I think we've talked about it in other movies before. I think the Friday the 13th films were... My big problem with those is, again, the censorship issue. For whatever reason, they just they didn't like the gore. So whenever there was a kill, they would just cut away really quick. And so there's one shot um, in the movie towards the end of the film where the Frank is being recaptured. Again, we're not going over the, the plot bit by bit. So I would recommend if you have seen Hellraiser, this review is for you. Um, or if you haven't and aren't sure, maybe the kinds of things that we tell you on this show will... Like you go see it because it's still worth watching. It's absolutely worth watching. I guarantee you, even now, you've never seen anything like it. Um, oh God, was it? Oh yeah, he, when he gets recaptured and he kind of gets torn to pieces really quickly, and his head kind of like explodes and rips off. Um, you can see it. It's it's still there. I think it still works in the film the way that they left it. So I guess I mean you, you take you take what you can get. I guess. Uh, if you can't get the movie you want made completely, do your absolute best and just hope that you get away with some things. I think that's the common practice in Hollywood is <clears throat> put a lot of crazy shit in the movie that you know is never going to be allowed so that when the studio comes and asks you to make cuts, you go, okay, well, I'll tell you what, I'll cut this and that, but let me keep these three scenes or this scene um, and make sure that the scenes you intend to, that you know you're going to cut anyway are worse than the one you want to keep. Uh, I've I've heard somebody say that. I, I I apologize. I can't remember what interview that was. Yeah, it may it may have been a uh, another horror director. I I'm not sure. I'm trying. It may have actually been a Hellraiser interview that I heard. I'm I can't remember. But yeah, this movie was. Man, it's what? Oh my God. Oh my! This is this is crazy. Uh, I'm getting a Star Trek alert, everybody. Um, I'm being told now in my earpiece. Uh, oh yes, the, the, one of the main stars of the film, um, Andrew Robinson. He uh, guest starred on several several episodes of Star Trek: Deep Space Nine. He played the uh, Cardassian Garrick, who was a simple tailor, or at least he said he was. But in reality, we all know he was a. He was a spy for the the uh, Obsidian Order. Uh, I don't think he's been in any of the other Star Trek besides that. I, I've had a habit of having a Star Trek alert and naming off a role that they uh, had done, but uh, and then later on I realized, oh, they also played something else. Although that's mostly a Jeffrey Combs thing. I had several interruptions of him. Uh, yeah. Anyways, Garrick, one of the best characters on that show, and um. I want to say I wish I had seen more of him, but I think part of what made it work so well is the infrequency of his appearances. It was He was on a few episodes a season or something like that. Several of them. So much so he actually wrote a book himself uh, about Garrick, and I think it was kind of write-ups of his time in the Obsidian Order, I think. Yeah, something like that. Uh, but anyways, <clears throat> uh, back to Hellraiser. Uh, yeah, 1987, the year I was born... Um, maybe that's why I have such a strong connection to it. Uh, I don't know. There's something about movies in the 80s, um, that just make it stand out. Like, I mean, it doesn't have, they, none of them have the budgets that also some of the horror movies these days do. And even by today's standards, horror movies have very, very minuscule budgets. Like, that's, I think it's the entire basis of Blumhouse, uh, that production company by, uh, I think his name is Jason Blum, uh, where it's like they crank out these horror movies for a couple million, you know, like 10 million or so, something like that, and then it just sees this crazy box office return. Uh, not all of them are good. <laughs> I think the, the Truth or Dare one looked like shit. 
I think Happy Death Day, people talk good about that, but I have not seen it. But yeah, back then, I'm not sure if that's was the opinion still. I mean, it could have been. I'm not sure. I was, again, I wasn't, you know, particularly aware of the movie scene at the time. Uh, I discovered this movie um, several years later, obviously, as I got older in the mid-90s or so. Uh, but yeah, P- Pinhead, man. It's, it's such a weird... It's a weird idea, because a lot of times in horror films, you have, like, main girl and a group of friends that are basically just there to die, and then you have a killer, like a Freddy or whatever, that's constantly coming for them or whatever. Uh, but this this movie wasn't the case. This is kind of a character study a little bit into uh, Frank and the his family a little bit. It's odd. But for those of you not aware... Um, I talked earlier about how Frank had, you know, he was he, he was seeking out new pleasures and stuff, and so he found this puzzle box, which, uh, in the lore, is called the, uh, I believe it's the Lament configuration. Um, I have one along with a pinhead figure in my display case. It's super awesome. I recommend you guys check those out. By Mezco Toys, I think they did it. Uh, there's other ones. Um, yeah, he gets a puzzle box. If you solve the box. Pinhead and the Cenobites come from what is essentially hell um, and show you all of these, expose you to all of these sensations, and that could be pain or they could be pleasure. Um, and so they kind of rip off all of his skin and take him with them. But then uh, at some point in the movie, uh, Frank's brother, who, uh, let me see, let's see his name, uh, Larry, Frank's brother Larry, who was played by uh, Andrew Robinson. Moves in with his uh, wife Julia, and into the house that where Frank was, because it's like their mom's house or whatever. Uh, somehow he gets his hand cut, and blood falls onto the floor in the attic where Frank was when the Cenobites took him. And then we get this really, again, still by today's standards, the effect of Frank, Frank's skinless, like fleshless body, coming out of the wood. Uh, from where the where the dr- the blood uh, dropped is it is if you have not seen the movie and you don't you can't actively find it or whatever I go, uh, look up on YouTube the scene of Frank reforming essentially it's stunning it's uh it's like the thing levels of um, jaw dropping uh, practical effects which is another thing that today's horror films are desperately missing. Um, yeah, man, I'm in awe every time I watch it. Uh, and there's several several shots like that when uh, he's getting tortured and, and ripped up. Uh, and yeah, a lot of bad shit happens to, <laughs> happens to Frank. And then basically he had an affair with Julia at some point, and Julia finds him up there, and she's freaked out. And she's kind of trying to get him uh, to come back to how he used to be. So she starts luring men up there for sex, but then killing them, and Frank what I can only assume sucks out their goo or something. I don't know. But he, he fucking, like, sucks them dry somehow. They never deliberately show what he does because he yells at Julia not to look at him. And over the every time he d- does this, sucks the life out of these people or however what he's doing, uh, he gets, like, more flesh and more of his... You know, he looks more human, but he's still skinless, like, the whole movie. Uh, it's really cool how, how it's done. Uh, so he's, when every time he touches something, there's blood all over it. Um, and then Julia, the uh, the wife, I'm sorry, uh, Kirsty, the daughter, um, has she's not in on a lot because I don't think she's living in the house. But she uh, steals the box because she finds Frank too, and she steals the box, and then she opens it, and we get like this is where we see uh, another summoning because she accidentally solves the box because she's like in a hospital or something because she got knocked out I can't remember how um, she opens the box herself on accident and the image of all of the Cenobites appearing in this room they did a really cool trick with all these lights where I think what the trick was um, you know how you could see light from like the corners of a door and under the door they do that with really really bright, uh, bright like, kind of bluish light so it's it's like this kind of shadowy it's almost like um when you leave a tv on and it's just static that kind of color in the room uh it's really 
an interesting shot. Again, I would look that up on YouTube. Uh, and every every time Pinhead talks, that motherfucker c- the commands your attention. Um, I do have a, a clip. I have these actually on my phone. These are text tones. I'm not currently using them. But he says stuff like this. Um, and there's another little taste right here. Yeah, basically saying anybody who solves the box has to come with them. But then she pleads, no, 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 you know, Frank got out, Frank got out. And they're, they're like, what the hell are you talking about? How did that happen? And like, if you're if you're lying, then we'll tear your soul apart. And that's the, that line. So as I was saying earlier, uh, God, I got away from this topic. I'm sorry. I was going to one point and then I got taken to another one. Uh, Pinhead is not like most horror movie uh, villains where they're co- they're they're just mindlessly coming at you to kill you. Pinhead's not like that. He honestly doesn't give a fuck unless you solve the box. Um, and he and he's not chasing after you because of some weird reason that he has to kill you. It's like he's trying to kind of enlighten you in a way to their ways because you felt the need to summon him. Uh, it's it's a really weird dynamic because Pinhead's not the villain of this movie. Um, and he's not the villain of the second movie either. It was only in the third one where they made they they changed him completely into kind of a standard horror movie kind of type because there's scenes in the third movie of he's just going around killing people just cuz cuz he's out and that's not what was supposed to happen. He usually doesn't he's not supposed to fuck with you unless you solve the box yourself. So they really diverted from that. And but those are the movies where Clive Barker wasn't involved. Clive Barker did the first two. Um which is why they're the only good ones, I guess. Uh, so the first movie was pretty much secluded to just the house and like a few short scenes like the hospital and then a scene in like a pet store and like maybe one scene like in a parking lot or something. Aside from those kind of isolated moments, the majority of the movie takes place in the house. Um, the second movie takes place, a lot of it actually they actually go to um, to hell basically. And we there's kind of like this hell takeover because uh, one guy kills. It's like this evil doctor who wanted to go to, to go to hell. He kills Pinhead or somehow takes eliminates him somehow and takes his place and becomes like the ruler of of hell. It's really I haven't seen that one uh, recently, so I'd have to rewatch it again. I may actually rewatch that for um, another solo review. trying to remember there there are a lot of cool um special effects shots in that one although i think there is some stop motion shots which i mean i i respect the hell out of stop motion and a lot of times especially back then it was absolutely necessary for some scenes but uh man the stop motion has not aged well when you have a movie like this where a, a big draw of it is how good the special the uh special effects are or practical effects i should be more specific and then you have a random th- a bit with stop motion. Uh, it it's it kind of takes you out of it a bit. Uh, at least for me. Um, the oh, and the first movie had had a thing where I I probably could have if I have one issue with the film, it's probably this thing where uh, Kirsty sees it for the first time. She summons them. It's like this weird monster that's. Like has its legs on the ceiling and it's crawling with its hands on the ground. It's kind of a cool shot at for at one point, but every other shot after when it's kind of zoomed out, it's very obviously just this like some kind of plastic coating on like a uh, basically a moving track. Um, so it doesn't look that good, and it kind of stands out amongst everything else. It's just not fitting. So I would have cut that, and it comes back again at the very end of the movie, which again I would have cut that. Um, I would have had the last monster guy you see be Pinhead or some of the other Cenobites. There's just like four of them. There's the, I think he's called Chatterer, which he's, he has like no lips and no like kind of surrounding mouth. So you just see his teeth and they're constantly like, you know, chattering because name. There's like a big fat guy whose name I can't remember. There's like the, I think she's called the Priestess, who's like a, she's a woman. I don't, I think she has like a something in her head, impaled in her head, and then Pinhead obviously has all the pins in his face. Um, played by Doug Bradley, who played him in 
I want to say four of the movies. There's a lot of these. Uh, honestly, after the third one, I um, I don't know. After the fourth one, I saw. I don't think I saw any of them. The first four, <clears throat> four is like part of it was kind of a prequel. Four was okay. Bloodline, I think it's called. Um, that one's all right. The third one's okay too. But that's kind of a. Uh, it's kind of where it stops, honestly. Um, yeah, that is where it. Uh, uh, what? What? What's this? Uh, we are getting a Star Trek alert. Another Star Trek alert. Yes, I. Oh, I made the mistake of mentioning Hellraiser three. The star of Hellraiser three was an actress by the name of Terry Farrell. You may remember her from the Ted Danson show. Uh, uh, what the fuck is it, Becker? Um, but you also may know her from Star Trek again, Star Trek Deep Space Nine. There's a lot of a lot of connections to Deep Space Nine. She played um Jadzia Dax, the Trill uh, Lieutenant, who was in the first six seasons and then left the show in, before season seven to join the show Becker. Um, I think she regrets it in hindsight. I don't know. But, uh, yeah, she was a standout in uh, Deep Space Nine. Uh, really stunning actress. She was, I think she was a model before. I think a lot of actresses were and are still. Uh, but anyways, yeah. So that was, an <laughs> that was an unplanned Star Trek alert. I didn't think I was going to mention the third one, but I did. Uh, let's take a look. I'm curious to see... Um, I'm curious to see what critics thought of this movie at the time. Uh... Let's see. Since release, the film has divided critics, but generally received praise. Initial reviews range from uh, Melody Maker calling it the greatest horror film made in Britain. That's high praise. Uh, to, Roger Ebert to Roger Ebert decrying its bankruptcy of imagination. It spawned nine sequels. The first seven, oh, he was in seven of them, uh, featured Doug Bradley as the lead Cenobite Pinhead. God damn, I don't know what Roger Ebert's issue is. The This movie... A bankruptcy of imagination? This is one of the most imaginative movies I've ever seen of any genre. I think Roger Ebert's kind of got his own head up his own ass. That's really upsetting to me. A little bit. Although he was old at the time. Maybe he just didn't get it. I don't know. I'm not sure. I know I like it more now. <clears throat> the more times I see it, the more I like it. Uh, yeah, but I think that uh, I think that's gonna about do it for Hellraiser. Um, this is, yeah, we've gone a, about a good length here. So uh, thanks everybody for hanging out with me on my uh, first ever solo review. Um, gonna be uh, having another few of these coming up just by myself and James by himself, of course, as you've already heard. Um, and then of course, don't worry, we are coming back to review stuff together. We have lots of things planned. We hope you all enjoyed your time with us this month. Um, before we get back to our regularly scheduled uh, movie reviews that are not horror. Um, and will we ever do horror movies not in October? That's an interesting question. I would imagine so, probably. Probably new stuff when that comes out. But for now, we're reliving the classics. Uh, movies old that we love and some new movies that we love. Um, so stay tuned, everybody. And we'll see you at the Spooky Movies.